were certified to do tear weights on whiskey. So back then, the reason you never heard about older age uh, bourbons and whiskey, you always heard about people finding old bottles of whiskey, but you never heard them finding old age bottles of whiskey. This law is called a two-year foresight law, and what the government would do is they knew that you were going to lose 15% of your whiskey during the first two years, 7% to the wood, and 3 to 5% to evaporation each year. So what they would do is you'd first fill the barrels with whiskey, and then they would make you weigh them. A pint's a pound the world around. Water is eight pounds to the gallon. A Buffalo Trace barrel at 125 proof, 53 gallons, will weigh about 550 pounds. But a Weller barrel at 53 gallons weighs more because Weller goes into the barrel at a lower proof and water weighs more than alcohol. So the taxes would be lower on a barrel of Weller than they would on a barrel of Buffalo Trace. Wow. <laughs> right? So you weigh the barrel, it gets better because then you have to dump the whiskey out of the barrel. It's to make sure that the whiskey in the barrel is what you're being taxed on. You dump the whiskey out and they weigh the barrel again and the difference between those two weights is what you paid your tax on. <laughs> Hmm. So they didn't care after that because once you paid your taxes, it was your barrel. The problem is you know about the evaporation of the whiskey out of the barrel. So the longer you left it around after you paid your taxes, the less you're going to have. And people back then did not appreciate older age bourbon. So that's why most of your bourbons average about two to four years old. Hmm. Kind of crazy? It's all about the taxes. Actually, it's kind of funny. Most people don't realize that when you start talking about some of these vintage products like we have, uh, by the time the consumer pours that drink into a glass, 59% um, of what they pay for is nothing but tax. And that's before it even gets flipped. 59%. And you end up with only about five or six gallons if you're doing like a Pappy 23 or something like that. So um, we're going to end up at the last drop. Uh, we've got a refrigerated unit. I'm not sure if you've heard about it. Most people have heard about Pompeii. Very few people have heard about the last drop. So we created a special refrigerated unit that slows that whole process down. But it makes for an exceptionally sweet thing. The deal is this. This number, the DSP number, is the permit that's issued by the federal government that allows distilleries to make products at their site. So anything coming out of Buffalo Chase Distillery carries DSP 113. Mm. If you were up the road to Woodford, their DSP number is 52. Maker's Mark is 440, Old Granddad's 14. If it's the MGP plant over in Lawrenceburg, Indiana, it's DSP IN1, okay? One, two, and three digit numbers on your cases when they arrive at your store, those are oldie but goldie distilleries. Those are established distilleries. If you see a four or a five digit DSP number, that's a new craft distillery coming online. Hmm. Or for the MGP plant, they decided they were not only were they gonna continue to let people source their products, but they also came up with their own DSP number for their products. So they have two DSP numbers over there. Right? There were, the government separated us into districts. So here in this little cluster right around Frankfurt is district number seven. And in district number seven is Wild Turkey, Four Roses, Woodford, Buffalo Trace. Uh, we've got uh, the James E. Pepper Distillery over in Lexington. We're all in district number seven. And in Brown Foreman and all those folks down in Louisville are in a different district. Uh, so uh, this chart has part of these. But these 10 distilleries right here make 95% of all the bourbon in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and right now, a lot of mergers and acquisitions are going on uh, where they're picking up labels from old distilleries and they're incorporating them into the products that make up their plant. But you look across, what the kicker is, when you look across, it'll tell you in which county uh, it was being made. So you'll see a lot of number ones and number twos, threes and fours, but they're all in different parts of the country. So in the industry, we're making bourbon under 18 labels, but what people lose sight of is uh, it's not about who makes the best bourbon. Because as a consumer, they decide what they like. The deal though is if I do make something and you like it, I have to understand all the piece parts because I've got to replicate the taste. And what we discovered was even though it's the same recipe coming out of the steel, the barrel is a majority of uh, the taste profile of the contributor to the taste you're going to get. So the single oak project was when we went down into the Ozarks and got 96 trees. We took the trees and cut them in half, we made a barrel from the top half of the tree, another barrel from the bottom half of the very same tree, put the same mash bill in both barrels, put the two barrels in the warehouse next to each other, <clears throat> came back eight years later, they all taste different. Huh. Yep. 
So that's when we discovered even the top half of an oak tree and the bottom half of the very same tree will produce different flavors. Then we watched, <clears throat> we watched the cooper assemble a barrel. There's 35 to 40 staves in the making of a barrel. They randomly reach and pick up the pieces of wood. The cool part is the staves, all the staves are of a different size. Oh, that's what these And the are. reason is it's the stipulation for bourbon. You're not allowed to put anything between your staves that will contaminate the flavor of the bourbon in a barrel. So by making the staves all different sizes, each piece of wood expands and contracts at a different rate. That's how the barrel stays leak proof. Mm. But when we saw the cooper doing that, we realized theoretically you could have up to 40 different trees in the making of one barrel. And so depending upon what grew around the base of that tree, where it grew in the forest, top of the ridge, north side, south side, down the valley, and the number of growth range per inch, each stave would produce a different flavor. So the combination of staves, based on the size of the stave, determined that stave's individual contribution to the flavor of the whiskey in that barrel alone. So we've now discovered over 300 chemical flavors that the human body can identify just in the oak. But when you mix the staves up and they're different sizes from different parts of the wood to different rings, you get different flavors. So that's why when you're doing your barrel selection, even though it's the same recipe, the vintage is going to be about the same, you're going to be amazed that you can actually taste the difference from one barrel to the next. Oh, yeah. Cool? Oh, yeah. All right, and so that's the first piece. The second piece is you always hear about the red line, and the red line shows you the depth that the whiskey actually went beyond the char in your barrel. Okay, that's how far it diffused it. Yes, but that's a traditional up in the top of the warehouse, like in your attic, warming up and cooling down, makes a definitive line. But let's think about this. If I want to make a really good roast or a really good steak, okay, what do I do? I season it and I put it back into the into the fridge and I leave it sit for two or three days. And the seasoning goes down through the marbleized layers of meat. And now the flavor is not just on the crust, it's all the way through the meat, right? Honey barrels. So a honey barrel, look at this, these are honey barrels. See this? You don't have a definitive line. The whiskey has gone all the way through the wood. To the outside. Yes. So what you do is, once you get the, the char is where that caramelized color is going to come from. All right? But when you char the inside of that barrel, the heat is actually breaking down the sugars and saps and rosins in the fibers of the wood. You cannot see them, but the human palate can detect them. So how do you know you have a honey barrel then? You have to really deconstruct it or you just... We know where, the, where we put the barrels in the warehouse determines that. So that's why, like, when Colonel Blanton did Warehouse H, um, he understood Kentucky had these big dramatic temperature swings. Yeah. Metal warehouses get really, really hot in the summertime, so that whiskey swells up, and just the molecules expand, like a two-liter soda bottle getting hot. Yeah. But in the wintertime, it gets darn cold. They contract. But Kentucky has 20 to 30 degree temperature swings on any given day, yeah. no matter what the season is. So it's constantly warming up and cooling down. But in the winter time, when the temperature reaches 45 degrees or cooler, it goes dormant. You might as well have it in a glass jar. This is where Yates Taylor comes in. Come here. See this big silver pipe? Yep. That's a high pressure steam line. And it connects all of these warehouses, including warehouse H. So what we do when the temperature starts to drop, we fire up the steam and we continue to warm those barrels up just like it was summertime. So the whiskey at this distillery never goes strong. So even in the wintertime, even though we were doing this stuff in the summertime with the metal warehouse, in the wintertime we continued that procedure by just pumping steam into that warehouse. Cool. These are brick warehouses there too. On top of we were the first to introduce climate. I say we, E.H. Taylor did it back in the 1800s. We were the first this year to introduce climatically controlled warehouses. And these buildings, yep. And he did it with steam. With steam. So right now we're generating, we'll, we'll uh, we, we can go into a portion of the power plant, but uh, right now we're generating a little over 400,000 steam pressure pounds per hour. And what that really means, and kind of like just thinking about it is, if we took that amount of steam pressure and hooked it to a bunch of turbines, we could produce enough electricity right here to light up a town. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. All right, so uh, the other thing that he did was, you hear about, like you were noticing, they, these are brick warehouses. This warehouse we're in, this used to be a warehouse that goes back to the 1800s. It's not the fact that it's a somebody's got their mic messed up. It's not the fact that it's a brick warehouse. It's the pattern of the brick. So when we get outside, you're gonna notice something. You can see it from in here. 
every six rows, the brick point inward. Every six rows. Every six rows. Every six rows, the point inward. It is called the King's Row. They knew when they built old warehouses like this, this warehouse, this building held 24,000 barrels of whiskey at one point. A full barrel of whiskey is 550 pounds. But when it starts to burn, it's like basically like a Molotov cocktail. You can't put them out, right? They knew that. They didn't have emergency response teams and drones that could fly over and drop them. They didn't have any of that stuff. So the term is called, we take care of our home. And these buildings are designed that when the infrastructure starts to burn and collapse, it pulls the walls in on top of the barrels like a flaky biscuit. And it traps the barrels with these brick. And that prevents the brick from the barrels from rolling away from here and burning down the rest of your distillery like happened at Heaven Hill. Huh. So all of these buildings are designed to implode on themselves. So no matter what building you're looking at, this design is in place so that the infrastructure is designed to collapse. And that's all because every six rows you put the brick? Yeah, they flake off like a flaky biscuit. <laughs> as, it, as the infrastructure comes down, it just pulls the walls in with it. Somebody smarter than me come up with this.